So this video is the second part of a series I'm doing on how to make this big open terrain that generates pretty much instantly. In the last video, I'll show you how to make a clip map and how to handle collisions on that clip map. I'll leave a link to that video in the description, but if you don't feel like watching it, I'll also leave a link to the project I'm starting with in this one. The second part will show you how to handle uh, levels of detail and how to stitch the seams along mesh between different, le different levels of detail. Now, the stitching part of the video is probably the hardest part of this whole series. So I'll try to speak a little slower and explain it the best I can. So right now we have a single plane mesh in our clip map that follows the player. We get a much greater draw distance by adding more mesh instances in a grid around the player. The further the mesh is away from the player, the fewer subdivisions it will have. First we'll save the mesh instance in the clip map as a new scene called clip map partition. Next we'll attach a script and add two variables called x and z. These represent where this partition is in the grid. Now let's preload it as a pack scene in the clip map script, then delete it from the clip map scene. We'll add an exported variable that determines the size of this grid, called distance. In the ready function, we'll create a two-dimensional for loop with an x and z integer that range from the negative distance value to the positive distance value plus one to iterate over every unit in this mesh grid. Inside the for loop, we'll first instantiate a partition using the pack scene, then set the x and z integers of the for loop to the x and z variables of the partition script, then add that partition as a child of the clip map. Then in the partition script, we'll use the x and z to set the position of the partition by multiplying them in a vector 3 by the length of the partition's plane mesh. Here's a bird's eye view of the grid with the x and z values for each partition. We can also use the maximum of the absolute x and z values to determine the LOD of each mesh. The LOD of a partition will be used to determine the number of times its mesh is subdivided. The higher the LOD value, the fewer the subdivisions. Now we're going to raise 2 to the power of the LOD value. This will give the length of the mesh's subdivisions. Then we divide the length of the partition by the length of its subdivisions and subtract 1 to get the subdivide width and depth. Make sure this is no less than zero. We'll also need to set a unique plane mesh for each partition, or else the subdivisions will be changed for every partition every time they're set. I'm going to create a variable named length used to set the size of each new plane mesh. This length will be needed in the clip map shader later on, so we'll add it as a global uniform named clip map partition length. I'm going to use a length of 16 for now, and get the value from the project settings in the partition script. We can just remove the plane mesh that's in the partition to start, since a new one will replace it anyway. Let's replace the mesh.size.x with partition length. It just looks cleaner. Now let's run the game. If you notice that your mesh is disappearing, it's because the mesh is raised up from the center of the mesh instance, so even though the mesh is in view, the mesh instance's position is outside of the camera's view for us to, and they're being called. We can prevent this by increasing the extra call margin on the mesh instance under its geometry section. Also, as you can see, as we move, the mesh has this odd wavy effect. This is actually the same wobbly effect from the last video, it just spread out and slower. Remember when I said that the clip map should only move in increments equal to the length of its subdivisions? Well, now those subdivisions are larger on the farther away mesh. If I replace round with snap, like we did on the collision map, this will go away. Since the farthest partitions are not divided at all, we'll snap the clip map to the length of its partitions. So we need these plane mesh along the far edges to match its neighboring mesh with a greater LOD value. This vertex at the center of the gap here, instead of getting its own height from the height map, it should get a height halfway between the vertices on either side so it matches the straight line of its neighboring mesh. Let's first start by calculating the LOD in the clip map shader. Here's another bird's eye view of the clip map with the LOD values of each mesh. When I hover the mouse over a vertex, we get a set of values, first the position in local space, then in global space, and then its position relative to the center of the clip map. Below that is the maximum of the absolute x and z values of that relative position. And lastly, that maximum divided by the partition length, then rounded. You'll notice that this last result is the same as the LOD of the vertex's mesh, with one important exception. The vertices along edges bordering a mesh with a greater LOD round up to that next LOD. Now let's add that calculation in the clip map shader. We'll need the position of the clip map in the shader, so we'll create another global uniform and set that in the clip map's physics process function after the statement setting its position. Now we'll subtract that from the world vertex, getting what I'll call the clip map vertex, then get the maximum of the absolutes of the clip map vertex.x and .z. We'll also declare that clip map partition length global uniform we created in the last video and divide that maximum by it, round that result and assign it to a float called LOD. Then we can raise two to the power of the LOD value to get the subdivision length. Make sure it isn't larger than the partition's length. Now back to the bird's eye view. When I highlight a vertex, it shows its local position and that position divided by the subdivision length. You can see along the edge between two meshes where the vertex heights line up and where they don't. Notice a pattern as I move along this edge. All the vertices that need to be stitched have a fraction of 0.5. So back in the shader, we'll first create a variant at the top called dev albedo. Set it to white at the top of the vertex function and then set it to the built-in albedo variable in the fragment function. This will be used to mark our mesh and make sure we're doing things right. Let's start with the edges just along the x-axis. Divide the local vertex.x by the subdivision length, then get the fraction from the result using the fract function. If this is equal to 0.5, then we know that this vertex needs to be stitched. 
For now, I'm just going to set the dev albedo to red if it's true. Now when we run the game, we can see that this is only half worked. The appropriate vertices are colored red, only every second edge moving away from the center, and the others aren't marked at all. Also these farthest away mesh are totally red, but we'll deal with that later. The reason this is only working half the time is because rounding doesn't occur the way you might expect in shaders. If a number has a fraction of 0.5, it's not always rounded up. It's rounded to the even number. So 2.5 doesn't round up to 3, it rounds down to 2. It took me a while to figure this out and it drove me a little insane. We can easily create our own rounding function to fix this. I'll call it true round. It'll take a float value, then return the floor of that value plus 0.5. Just a side note, this function will only work properly for positive numbers. Now every seam is marked properly. Again, just ignore this back here for now. Let's do this for the edges along the z-axis, marking them blue instead. We can actually use the fract function on vec3s, so just delete the dot x here, change the fraction type from float to vec3, then add dot x to the fraction in this if statement. Now we'll duplicate that but with the z value of the fraction and mark it blue. It's typically not advised to use if statements in shaders, and we'll get to that in a bit. So let's actually set the height of these vertices to stitch the mesh seams. To make this easier, we'll create a get height function. This will have world vertex as a parameter, and we can just copy the code from here, except I'm going to call this height map position instead of texture position, it'll also need a type of vec2, and return the height value instead of setting it to the vertex.y. Then we'll set the y value of the vertex built in here with the get height function instead. And I'm going to rename the texture position varying to normal map position, since that's all we're using it for now. So the height of this vertex that we're stitching should have a height in the middle of the ones next to it. Each will be half the length of a subdivision away along the edge it's on. So along the x edge, these heights will be at the vertex's position plus 0.5 times the subdivision length on the x-axis and minus that on the x-axis. We can use the mix function, which is the shader equivalent of lerp, with these two heights and a weight of 0.5 to get a value directly in the middle and then set that to the y of the vertex built in. We'll do the same on the edge along the z-axis, but adding and subtracting to the z of the local vertex position. And remember, if statements are not the greatest, but we're getting to that. Now everything is stitched. Well, everything except for the outermost seams. And these farthest mesh are totally blue now. That's because out here the subdivision length is the size of our partition, in this case 32, and the four vertices have x and z values that range from negative 16 to positive 16. This is an easy fix. We just add half the clip map partition length to the vertex in the fraction calculation before dividing it. Now in this calculation, they range from 0 to positive 32. I just noticed while I was editing that I actually made a mistake there. I said that we're using a partition length of 32. We're actually using a partition length of 16 and the vertices range from negative eight to positive eight. I just wanted to clear that up in case it threw anybody off. And now we'll deal with the if statements. So let's say I replace this weight with fraction.x and remove the if statement. What would happen if the fraction was zero? Well, the mix function would return this first height value down the x-axis in the negative direction away from the vertex. But what if I multiplied the subdivision length by the fraction.x as well? then we would just be subtracting by zero and getting the height of the vertex, which is what we want if the fraction is zero since no stitching is necessary in that case. And if the fraction is 0.5, then that works too. We might as well replace the 0.5 in the second get height function with fraction.x as well. So let's also implement this along the z edges, but with fraction.z. Our next problem is that the second statement for the z edges overwrites the one for the x edges, and only the z edges are stitched. So instead, let's assign these to variables called x height and z height. Then we'll use those as arguments in the mix function, x height coming first and z height coming second, and fraction.z rounded as the weight. Use true round or else this will always resolve to zero. Now if the z edge needs to be stitched, this weight will be one and the calculation for the z edge will be used. Otherwise the calculation for the x edge will be used. Since these x and z height variables are only being used once, we might as well refactor this. Lastly, let's customize the LOD a bit. Let's add a new global variable called LOD step with a value of two then retrieve that in the clip map partition script and multiply the LOD value by it. Now the LOD decreases twice as fast, but there are also three vertices side by side that need to be stitched. Well, all we have to do to remedy this is multiply the subdivision length by one minus the fraction in the second get height call in the mix functions on each edge. Now the fractions might be less than 0.5, but above zero. If fraction.z is anything above zero, then we want there to be stitching along the z edge. So we'll need to use seal instead of true round here and we need to multiply the LOD value by LOD step in the shader as well. So my next video will probably be a fair bit shorter than these last two. I'm just gonna show you how to calculate normals in the shader instead of using a normal map. That's just gonna make things a lot simpler going forward. So um, yeah, hopefully this was helpful and thanks for watching.